Welcome back, everybody. We're here with another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast for Western Pennsylvania. Today is May 20th, 2014. It's election day. It's a happy birthday to Greg Nicosia and Ted Sibick, two friends of ours. And I want to remind everybody that we have a new print issue coming uh, out uh, by the 1st of June. And we will have doubled the number of uh, people in the next issue, the contributors. Uh, we've got a very interesting issue. Dr. Dan Wagner is in with a discussion about calcium, too much calcium. And that's all based on a conversation he had with a, a presentation by Dr. Thomas Levy, who is our guest today. So that's coming up in the print issue, along with uh, Dr. Dennis Courtney and some ozone therapy. Uh, he is now licensed to perform that in Pennsylvania, some very exciting things there. So I want to remind you that we are recording live every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine and on our YouTube channel and Google Plus page. And you can find us every week on Facebook, Google Plus, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, and probably by the time you hear this, one or two more places that uh, our engineer Mike, the bionic man, Sorg, has managed to find us into. So I want to introduce and get right to our first guest, our only guest, our uh, special guest this hour is Dr. Thomas Levy. He is the author of several groundbreaking books, including Primal Panacea, Curing the Incurable, Stop America's Number One Killer, and most recently, Death by Calcium. And when I say your hair is going to explode and your, your hair is going to catch on fire, I mean it. This, everything you know about nutrition is wrong, according to Dr. Levy. So we should have some fun. And uh, joining us in the conversation is Terry Taylor, my friend and fellow journalist, an award, Emmy Award winning journalist, and uh, always a lot of fun, uh, fun and uh, insightful uh, questioning. Uh, not a lot going on in the calendar this week, so we're just going to skip that segment and get right to our guest. He is a graduate of uh, both the John Hopkins and Tulane School of Medicine, board certified in internal medicine and cardiovascular diseases. And he's a lawyer and apparently an overachiever and uh, now a consultant with Live On Labs. Uh, Dr. Thomas Levy, welcome to our podcast. Well, great to have you with us. Glad to be here. I, I, I guess I've done everything, but I haven't gotten rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet, anyway. We're working on that. Not yet. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be on the show, and uh, hopefully we can let a few more people know what's going on with some of the supplements they're taking. That's great. And uh, like I say, joining us is Terry Taylor. How are you doing today, Terry? Yeah, I'm doing well. The sun has finally come out. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how the weather is in Biloxi, but uh, not too bad in Pittsburgh today. I'm really yeah. pleased that Dr. Levy's on the show with us. I'm really sorry to have missed his lecture, but we're going to get a, a personalized account of it today. So that's good stuff. And I, I guess we're going to start off by uh, talking about calcium. Uh, according to Dr. Levy, it's a, a marketing ploy, these high dairy diets and uh, all of these pills that we're trying to take, especially women, uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia, we're supposed to be taking our calcium, but uh, according to Dr. Levy, uh, not so fast, huh? Well, I, I seriously doubt that the marketing that dairy does would be the first time a corporation has sought to mislead for, for profits, or, or if they're not misleading, then they're seriously clueless. Probably the single greatest thing I could say to start this out is that the book, Death by Calcium, that title is not an exaggeration. Uh, this book has been long in the making, but really it's the literature over the last three or four years that have just made the case ironclad. Probably the single most impressive study, although there are many different impressive studies, the single most impressive one was conducted over a 19-year period on over 61,000 women and found that the women with the highest calcium consumption, whether it was from supplements or dairy or both, but total calcium consumption, had two and a half times greater death rate than the women with the lowest calcium consumption. So that's where the case starts. And in the talk I gave at Pittsburgh the other day and in the book, uh, the listener or the reader can readily see that this is not an isolated, aberrant study, but that it's soundly supported by so much other stuff we now know about calcium. 
Dr. Levy, how is it that we have, or, you know, do we have such an epidemic of osteoporosis uh, and at the same time uh, have too much calcium? How is that possible? Help, help us get our mind around that. Well, it's a good question and a good point. Uh, what we get continually sold on, both by physicians and by the public and by marketing, and I think to a great degree, this is a uh, solidly held belief, even though it's not true, is that we have a calcium deficiency. Well, in osteoporotic bone, there, in the bone, sure, there's a deficiency of calcium. That's, that's what happens in osteoporosis is as the bone breaks down, you release the calcium that's part of the structure of the bone. But, and this is the big but, it's exactly the people who have the greatest calcium deficiency in the bone that have the greatest calcium excess everywhere else in the body. As this calcium comes out of the bone, some of it gets excreted in the urine and the rest gets deposited in the tissues. Hmm. When you consider the fact that the skeleton has over 99% of the calcium stores in the body, you can see it's got an awful lot to give to the rest of the body as the deterioration of osteoporosis continues to take place. So, in fact, uh, calcium deficiency in the bones for most people, yes. Calcium excess everywhere else for most people, yes. What, what, so, Dr. Levy, yeah. does that mean that um, what's leaching out of where the calcium is supposed to be are bones and, I guess, our teeth? That's where the calcium is supposed to be. It winds up uh, lining our arteries. Uh, it winds up uh, maybe making uh, arthritic calcifications along our spine. I mean, it winds up depositing in all the places that it shouldn't be. That's absolutely correct. And I think it's important, and I like to make this point when I make this presentation uh, to both doctors and lay folks, is that even though we, we all know we're going to die someday and we're going to have some disease or another and one way or another life is going to come to an end, let me emphasize it is never normal to have any part of your body outside of the bones calcified. Okay? That's always abnormal. It indicates an abnormal calcium metabolism and invariably indicates an excess of calcium, which is doing the only thing it can do when it finally gets too concentrated in solution is to settle out of solution and deposit. Outside of the cells, the extracellular space, there's roughly 10,000-fold more calcium than inside the cells. So the deposition always takes place outside the cells, but there's a lot of pathology that's fed as that super excess outside of the cells gradually starts making its way inside the cell. Once it starts to get increased concentration inside the cell, a wide variety of diseases take place because... All diseases are characterized and promoted by increased intracellular oxidative stress inside the affected cells and increased calcium levels always cause an associated increase in this oxidative stress. Um, uh, wow. Let, let me go back. Can I follow a, up? Sam? Yeah, please do, because uh, my head's spinning. Go yeah. ahead. Just, just, just one, one question, Dr. Levy, and this is kind of a side point, but, um, you know, does heavy metal poisoning play any role in the leaching of the calcium from our bones and from our teeth? In other words, when you look at, uh, for example, um, an x-ray image of a child with lead poisoning, and you see uh, white all along the skeleton, and those are the lead deposits, um, that kid's probably doesn't, you know, the calcium is missing from those bones. In other words, is there a relationship between heavy metal poisoning and um, this leaching of calcium from the bones? Absolutely. And wherever there's increased heavy metals, such as lead, there's increased oxidative stress. This is what causes the toxicity to exist is how much a given agent, in this case a heavy metal, causes oxidative stress. And it's nothing more than increased oxidative stress or focal scurvy, if you will, that causes osteoporosis to be fed and to cause the bones to go on, if you will, 
an oxidative fire and start to release calcium. So the other thing that's important to realize about heavy metals, in this case, there was a study done on mercury toxicity. And this was very interesting. It was very clearly determined that mercury exerts its toxicity by increasing the intracellular oxidative stress via increasing calcium concentrations inside the affected cells to the point where you either get cell death or you maintain a chronic elevation and have a seriously sick cell. So yes, heavy metals play a role in a number of different ways uh, in the toxicity of calcium and in the abnormal metabolism of calcium. So just to make sure I'm clear, what is it exactly that's causing the osteoporosis? Um, you're saying there's some heavy metals, there's some mercury, and and tie that together. Well, bottom, bottom line is, is the only thing that causes osteoporosis is increased oxidative stress. In other words, okay. more oxidants than reductants, more oxidants than antioxidants. As is the case in the rest of the body, the vitamin C is the king antioxidant in terms of concentrating there. And wherever you have increased oxidative stress, you have correspondingly decreased levels of vitamin C. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the increased oxidative stress. So even though osteoporosis is much more difficult to treat than just administering vitamin C, by the same token, we do have a host of studies that show as a monotherapy, only giving vitamin C in high enough doses and nothing else will decrease fracture incidence and will help to build new bone. Okay. Terry, you have a question to follow up on any of that? Uh, actually, um, I think this is a great place to spring into one of Dr. Levy's other specialties, which would uh, either be vitamin C or glutathione. Yeah, I was just going to um, say, let's, let's go with the vitamin C because uh, I have a bunch of questions around that too. Well, shoot. Okay, so uh, Dr. Levy, so um, if glutathione is the antioxidant that our body produces itself, and vitamin C is the main one that we need to consume in order to keep our levels up, um, what it would seem that vitamin C, and in your writings, vitamin C is critical, and critical that we add more of it to the body. And what's really interesting is that, uh, you know, I think we made a full disclosure when we introduced you that you've moved to private industry because of your uh, interest in edification around the liposomals as a particularly good form of getting vitamin C into the body. And I wonder if I haven't opened up too big of a... <laughs> of a uh, <laughs> too big of a, a topic here. We're not done one question, so. Terry. Number Come on. One, uh, <laughs> what did, how important is uh, the addition of vitamin C to our diets? And number two, what are the best ways of, uh, of getting it in? Obviously, it's going to help with the situation you've just described of, uh, of uh, leaching calcium. Tell us about the, uh, the king of antioxidants. Well, the unfortunate thing, certainly unfortunate if it's not realized about vitamin C, is in today's toxic world where we breathe them, we eat them, we get them through the skin, we get toxins everywhere, uh, these are all pro-oxidant in nature and they require a corresponding increase in the antioxidant capacity of the body to protect you from that toxicity. So in this regard, you can never come remotely close to the amount of vitamin C you need on a daily basis with a diet. Hmm. Now, that's not to say a good diet is not important. I mean, you get a lot of other nutrients from the diet, but never delude yourself into thinking that having a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice is going to give you 12,000 milligrams of vitamin C, which is what a lot of people need on a daily basis to deal with their toxins. Hmm. That glass of orange juice might give you a couple hundred milligrams tops. So why would we need so much? Well, that's another story too. As it turns out, most of the animals in the animal kingdom have the four enzymes in the liver that are needed to naturally synthesize vitamin C from glucose. Well, in the human being, we're missing the fourth enzyme, L-galonolactone oxidase, so we can't make vitamin C. We're genetically deficient. We have a genetic mutation. Uh, and it's really this mutation that accounts for the fact that most people are taking 
a wad of prescription medicines and have chronic degenerative diseases for a good 50% of their lives, while wild animals pretty much live healthy through their lifespan and then die. I've always wondered about that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, you you have to ask a question, Terry, because again, my head just spinning from all of that. Oh, okay. Um, I'm 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 watching the, the delay here, and so I'm <laughs> I'm seeing Dr. Levy seemingly answering the question. Yeah, I, Dr. I, Levy, that's that's completely fascinating. I mean, how were we so unlucky to be missing this this enzyme? Uh, of course, you probably don't have the answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, maybe only God knows, but um, because of this, um, we need to we we need to do something, especially with uh, the onslaught of uh, toxins in the environment that vitamin C is going to help clean up. Uh, what talk to us now about the forms of vitamin C and what's the best way to get it into our uh, cellular and extracellular spaces? Well, let me say I, I went to great length in the new book, Death by Calcium, to write a very, very extensive guide on the optimal administration of vitamin C because I've been doing programs and writing articles and addressing this question for many years now. So I've finally been able to put it all in one spot where part of what I'm going to tell you in the answer can be found. Uh, basically, for good health, you want to take enough vitamin C to deal with the amount of oxidative stress you deal on a daily basis, uh, plus a little more to give you protection. Now, this is going to vary widely from one person to the next. Uh, someone with a large amount of dental toxicity, including root canals, many times cannot take enough vitamin C to protect themselves completely, which is why root canals and dental infections are so highly associated with and causes for cancer and heart disease and heart attacks and that sort of thing. On the other hand, when you have a good mouth, when you don't have a toxic gut, most people are going to get the amount of protection they need from between five and 15,000 milligrams of regular vitamin C a day. That's ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate. The company to which I'm a consultant, Live On Labs, came out about 10 years ago with a liposome encapsulated preparation. And this has opened a whole new realm of clinical ability because the liposome, without getting into too much detail because of our limited time, allows orally an intracellular delivery that vastly exceeds giving vitamin C intravenously. And this might seem paradoxical at first, but when you give vitamin C intravenously, it's just vitamin C. When you take liposomes orally, they're liposomes also in the blood so you don't have unencapsulated vitamin C in the blood. You have vitamin C in liposomes. And this allows a tremendous non-energy requiring delivery of vitamin C or whatever else is encapsulated in the liposome directly inside the cell. So it's good if people are really wanting to maintain good health to have a gram or two of liposome encapsulated, five to ten of regular uh, and if there's illness being involved, then you try to hit it with everything you can. You take fat-soluble forms of vitamin C, like ascorbyl palmitate, and if you're dealing with cancer, if you're dealing with trying to reverse coronary heart disease, which certainly is possible when you address it correctly, you sometimes need intermittent intravenous infusions to go along with the other forms. So suffice it to say, that's a big lump of information, but I mean, there's just not a one-size-fits-all category, and it's nice when things are simple, but when people are looking for a simple answer as to how much vitamin C should I take, there's a lot of things to be taken into consideration, not the least of which is a doc who can follow you and your blood work so that you can see down the road, are my abnormal blood tests getting more normal? Are they staying abnormal at the same level? Or are they getting more abnormal over time, in which case I need to take a different approach? Dr. Levy, is there hmm. any way to to try to gauge where where we should be on the intake? I mean, the old adage with just the regular ascorbic acid was you just take as much as you can take until you get diarrhea and then back off a little bit, and that's your maximum dosage. But obviously with the liposomal, we're bypassing that problem and getting to much better levels of C absorption. Is there any way to know 
rule of thumb wise, body weight wise, level of toxicity, any kind of measurements out there to say how much is the optimal amount I should be taking? Or if, if I've already had root canals, should I just take as much as I can afford? If you already had root canals, you take as much as you can afford. Okay. If you're not dealing with root canals, uh, yes, the bowel tolerance is a grossly good way to, to gauge dosage. But the, the thing I just mentioned, along with clinical correlation, is the best. And what I just mentioned is if you have clearly abnormal blood works, elevated triglyceride, cholesterol, slightly elevated glucose, the other parameters of the metabolic syndrome, which can lead over time to an increased uh, risk of heart attack, you see over time is the dose I'm taking at least stabilizing these things and hopefully making it better. The other thing, most people have a disease and the disease has symptoms. It's got headache, joint pain, poor vision, uh, fatigue. Uh, how is my daily vitamin C helping that? Am I completely relieved of symptoms? I'm at a good dose. Am I partially relieved of symptoms? It's good to try an increased dose and see early on, is it at least possible for me to take enough vitamin C to feel completely well or am I going to have to settle for a partial symptom relief? So all of those factors come into play. So there is no real theoretical maximum dose with the liposomals? Or at any point does it become toxic? Uh, no form of the vitamin C ever becomes toxic. Uh, uh, the liposomal, uh, when you start taking a very large number of grams of that, you have a lot of lipid with it, and sometimes the lipid might go unabsorbed and it'll get down to your colon, and you won't have the diarrhea that you see with regular vitamin C, but you'll get a loose, greasy stool. Okay. That's when you really start to take a lot of it. Hmm. Most of the time, if you're taking a properly encapsulated, liposome encapsulated supplement, one to five grams is going to take care of just about everything. Hmm. Okay. D Dr. Levy, can the liposomal vitamin C have a diuretic effect at higher doses? Um. Probably to a limited degree, but nowhere near the degree that you see with regular vitamin C. This is because, to my understanding, uh, whatever diuretic effect you do have with vitamin C, and there is a known mild diuretic effect, really has to do with the vitamin C in the blood that eventually presents itself to the renal tubules. In the case of the liposomes, very little of the vitamin C gets excreted. And if it does get excreted, part of it will get excreted, encapsulated in liposomes, and the rest of it is just going to take, get taken out of the blood and go into the cells. So for an equivalent dosage, if you will, there, you're not going to nearly have the percentage of vitamin C that ultimately gets presented to the renal tubules that you would taking an ordinary or regular form of vitamin C. Okay, that's good information. So just to summarize on vitamin C then, the reason that we want different forms of vitamin C in our diet is because this vitamin C is uh, being absorbed uh, differently. For example, the liposomal form is going directly into the cell, has the ability to do that, whereas the ascorbic acid or the sodium ascorbate is more in the extracellular spaces or interstitial spaces. Is, am I correct about that? Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. There's another thing that the regular vitamin C plays a very important role in, and that is we're talking about sodium ascorbate or ascorbic acid, is that as you take it orally, you get a substantial immediate neutralization of highly potent toxins that develop in the gut secondary to poor digestion. Hmm. These toxins can be of the highest order, just as toxic believe it or not, as some of the toxins we've seen in root canal treated teeth, which are toxins that just knock the ball out the park. They're, they're more toxic than botulism. Wow. So when you're taking vitamin C orally, uh, causing the increased motility of the gut, uh, perhaps a diarrheal bowel movement, but perhaps just a more ready bowel movement, you minimize the enormous digestive toxicity that a lot of people who have a bowel movement less than once a day start to develop. So you, you not only do that, you also deliver a, vital, a lot of vitamin C to the immune cells since the lymphatics 
are probably uh, more concentrated uh, as you absorb substances from the intestine anywhere else in the body. So when you're taking the vitamin C by that form, uh, just as you are with the liposomes, you get a good exposure to the immune cells before it ever comes close to the blood. Whereas when you give something intravenously, you're bypassing the gut intra completely and you're immediately trying to get your extracellular concentrations throughout the body as high as possible. Wow. Okay, so that, that makes sense for why the three different forms, especially in uh, acute illness, would be important. Now, just uh, one final question from me. Um, what is the preferred form for oral consumption? Would it be the uh, sodium ascorbate, the uh, buffered vitamin C, or would it be ascorbic acid? Does it matter? <clears throat> for a regular vitamin C, ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate, uh, I generally like to go with sodium ascorbate. If somebody can tolerate large doses of ascorbic acid without an upset stomach or a burning stomach or a gastric or, 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 or gastric discomfort, fine. It's, it's, it's excellent. But I find it's easier just to go ahead directly with the sodium ascorbate, which is pH neutral, very, very well tolerated. Uh, and to allay some people's concerns, uh, it doesn't cause the sodium overload. When you hear the concept about a low sodium diet, that's actually a, bit, a bunch of bunk. The New England Journal of Medicine of all places settled it some years ago when they showed you need to decrease sodium chloride, not sodium. Sodium mm -hmm. chloride expands volume, but sodium ascorbate, uh, sodium mm -hmm. bicarbonate, sodium, anything else has no effect on the volume. So you don't need in cardiac patients who are very sensitive to the volume, need to limit your sodium per se, but you do need to limit your sodium chloride. I've got a kind of a, a secondary question here too. Now, I want to tie in a topic that we haven't talked about a lot, but is something that a lot of people who are into natural health pay a lot of attention to, and that is your, your pH level. And the general understanding is that the more greens you eat, the, the more alkaline your pH is. And I've heard that that's one of the things that will help keep osteoporosis from happening. Um, can you comment, Dr. Levy, a little bit about that whole area and, and are we on the right track with that or how does that tie in with the things we've been talking about? Well, you have to start with where the pH is. Uh, there's really nothing you can chronically eat, acidic or alkaline, that's going to significantly impact the pH of your blood. Hmm. I mean, that stays fairly fixed in a very narrow range and you have a very large protein buffer system that's, that keeps it there. When you start to get derangements of the blood pH in either direction, alkaline or acidic, uh, you're looking at a really sick individual. Now, in terms of bodily fluids, you know, it's good to keep uh, most of the bodily fluids on the alkaline side if possible, the saliva, the urine, etc. cetera. Uh, when you're looking at microenvironments around cells, it's an acidic environment that strongly promotes disease. Right. So uh, I don't know that it's important in terms of eating fresh food to just go toward foods that produce an alkaline outcome. I think it's just important really to have a, a, well, a well balanced fresh vegetable and produce diet uh, without, without any particular fatism. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't just overdo one to the to the to the detriment of the other just because there might be a difference uh, in their pH impact. Sure. You can you can you can keep the urine where you want it with the sodium ascorbate and the other forms of vitamin C and the other supplementation that's recommended. Okay. And just to expand on one more point too, can you talk a little bit more about some of the different causes of this oxidative stress, which is so much of the problem? Well, ultimately, first of all, let's talk about a synonym. Oxidative stress is inflammation. Inflammation is oxidative stress. Okay. Those are really the same thing. And a third, third synonym is oxidative stress, inflammation, antioxidant deficiency. Okay. The thing that I realized 
of quite a few years ago when writing Curing the Incurable is that I knew vitamin C could neutralize all toxins, but I didn't understand how one single chemical substance can neutralize such a wide and diverse array of chemicals as exist in toxins. Right. Obviously, it can't unless there's a final common denominator, and that final common denominator is all toxins are prooxidant. All toxins take electrons away, and vitamin C can either neutralize the toxin directly by donating an electron or go in and neutralize the damage to the tissue where the electrons were taken away. So this is why also that we have all disease, all disease. Any disease that you can name, I can tell you, it's increased oxidative stress in certain tissues and certain cells of the body uh, at a certain concentration of toxicity for a certain chronic period of time, and that's going to determine the nature of your condition. Uh, and even though the cure or the solution is very simple, which is slow down the oxidative stress, get antioxidant levels elevated in those areas, it's not so simple to get it done. But what you need to do is you need to get antioxidants up in diseased tissues. How you do that is a more involved story, but it's doable. Okay. Yeah. A more involved story, I would say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we want to cover a couple more points here uh, in the next few minutes. But I just I have w one question that I always like to ask you know, people who've done as much research and, and, and have as much hands-on experience as you do is, uh, I mean, you seem to be one of the few doctors who actually pays attention to the science. Why is it that so many of these kinds of studies that you mentioned just go completely ignored? Is it really the corporate pressure or is it a combination of the, the corporate money pressure and the, the, arrogance and can I say stupidity of most doctors? Well, let me start by saying I've said for some time and I maintain more than ever that the best way to bury a quality piece of information is to put it in the medical or scientific literature. <laughs> it's, then, it's then lost forever. Uh, <laughs> doctors don't even read their subspecialty journals. A lot of the stuff that I cite I've had doctors talk to me, well, I've never seen that before. And as it turns out, it was in their own subspecialty journal. I said, well, you just don't read your own journals. But the thing is, is yes, I'll give doctors and dentists for that matter, the fact that they're very busy. They don't have the time to read a lot. I understand that. But there's a scenario called the medical textbook syndrome. Okay. The medical textbook the docs think if something's not in the medical textbook, it can't be meaningful enough or relevant enough to be true, so I'm not even going to give it the time of day. So the first thing that happens is information has to come from certain sources. If it comes from sources other than the sources they consider valid, they're not going to give it the time of day. As it turns out, this really leads to ludicrous outcomes. I mean, we have over 80,000 articles in the literature on vitamin C with just about every disease imaginable. In the two main textbooks of medicine, the Cecil Textbook of Medicine and Harris, Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, mention zero, zero, zero about vitamin C in them, except to say that vitamin C cures scurvy. So <laughs> you're really dealing, uh, you know, why are all the reasons for this? I can't tell you, but that's the way it is. I, You know, I interviewed uh, Dr. Louis Melmadrona one time, and he he pointed this out that, you know, the the, the arrogance of doctors is, uh, and not all, certainly, but when they get into no. that state of, of arrogance, it's that what we know today is the absolute truth and everything we need to know, even though it's completely different than what we knew two years ago. And we can assume that two years from now, everything we knew now is different. And the next new thing will be the, the everything we need to know. It just seems like there's some blinders on that a lot of doctors just don't want to pay attention to really even common sense sometimes, or even their own eyeballs when they see their own patients get better using just diet. Well, a lot of it, too, comes from what I call the paradox of the battle of the experts. 
do you tell me the scenario whether something causes this disease or something re relieves this disease, this is toxic, this isn't toxic, no matter what the issue is, I can get you two doctors that have had a completely regular medical education and then from there gone off into different directions but are rec recognized as experts among their peers and they say the exact opposite thing. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the question. This begs the question. Can they both be correct? The answer is, of course not. There is only one truth. And just because you manage to rationalize your situation by finding something you can possibly twist into supporting your point of view doesn't mean that you should be so disingenuous as to promote that as the truth. But that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know we want to get into uh, two more areas uh, if we have if we have enough time. Uh, Terry, did you want to ask some questions about glutathione? Well, sure, I'd be delighted to. Yeah. I, I really like the way that you uh, put that, Doctor Levy. It's it's incredible. Um, if it doesn't appear in a textbook, if it doesn't appear in a medical journal, uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, I know uh, with my own uh, battle with cancer. Um, if I'm uh, if I want to prove it, um, I'm going to be looking for the new research, not something that's uh, at least 15 years old. And there's this time lag also. Uh, maybe it takes uh, 15 years to get some of the research done. Maybe it takes another 15 years for Big Pharma to pick it up and run a phase one trial and then a phase two trial. And by the time we've got something that's even worth people trying, well, we're, you know, 40 years down the road and it probably got dumped because you couldn't get a patent on it in the first place. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult relying uh, solely on uh, conventional uh, medical wisdom uh, when, you're, uh, when, you're, when you're running a pitched battle, especially in these days and times when we, uh, we need to work quickly because so many people are sick in epidemic numbers from the kind of free radical activity that, uh, that you've been describing, which takes us to glutathione. Uh, but thank you for your time. That was the best segue <laughs> ever. <laughs> Vitamin C is the king, or maybe I should say queen of antioxidants, then glutathione might be considered the, uh, the master antioxidant. Um, you know, C and E and maybe selenium uh, occur naturally in nature uh, outside of us, but uh, glutathione doesn't really until we've, uh, we've recently figured out how to make it so. Um, it's been credited with increasing energy, slowing the aging process, uh, better athletic recovery, mental focus and clarity, uh, practically everything. Um, you were remarking before that vitamin C, uh, how could vitamin C take care of all toxins? Well, it seems like glutathione is almost in the same boat, although, albeit in a different way. Could you tell us uh, what's the main difference between vitamin C and glutathione? Seems like they do a lot of the same thing. Sure, uh, but let me first ask you if there's any such thing as conventional medical wisdom. I would call it a conventional medical point of view, but being just calling it wisdom <laughs> is a bit generous. <laughs> like uh, military quite intelligence. Right. Quite, <laughs> yeah. Now, about, about glutathione, it's important, you know, number one, uh, and, uh, to realize that you have an antioxidant matrix or network in your body, and they're all designed to work mutually together, even synergistically, for the final common denominator of donating, donating an electron where it needs to be donated. Now, with that in mind, inside the cell where glutathione is at its highest concentration, there's no question it rules the roost of antioxidants inside the cell, which of course is where a very large amount, most of the disease of the body is located, which is inside the cell. And when you have increased intracellular oxidative stress, you always have disease. And the best way to keep that intracellular oxidative stress down or normal is by maintaining a normal glutathione level in the cell. But what maintains that normal level? One of the most important things that maintains that normal level is having a regular influx of reduced vitamin C to help regenerate uh, the oxidized glutathione back to its reduced or oxygen-rich counterpart. So, hmm. Really, probably the best way to characterize the, the, the two of them is uh, the glutathione rules king inside the cell, vitamin C rules outside the cell, but 
vitamin C can't be considered the bastard stepchild of glutathione because glutathione could never get regenerated without the vitamin C. Mm. Uh, now, the, the glutathione inside the cell also plays a very critical role with a large amount of glutathione-related enzymes, transferases <coughs> that directly um, complex with, uh, neutralize, and excrete different forms of toxins. So they all play a role there. The difficulty with glutathione is it's sort of uh, difficult unless you have a very good liposome encapsulated form of glutathione to get the glutathione inside the cell through any form of supplementation. Whey protein and acetylcysteine, these things will support glutathione synthesis, but ironically enough, when you give glutathione intravenously, in about one minute, it's broken down to its component three amino acids. And then in order to make glutathione in the cell, you need to have three separate energy-consuming transport pathways to get those amino acids in the cell, and then you need two ATP-consuming enzymes to synthesize those three component amino acids in the glutathione. Bottom line being, even when you have glutathione floating in your blood, you need to consume energy five separate steps to get a glutathione molecule intact, produced, and functioning in the cell. On the other hand, when you have a good liposome encapsulated preparation, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of a good liposome preparation, is that you get an influx and delivery into the cell without the consumption of energy. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what yeah. about a glutathione palmitate? What about a, a transdermal uh, application? Um, I'm not familiar with a transdermal application of glutathione, but if it can, uh, if the if the pharmacokinetics uh, show that that can. Uh, Get the glu uh, excuse me. Get the glutathione um, uh, through the cell wall uh, by virtue of what it's attached to. Well, that that'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, glutathione levels uh, they're under attack, just like vitamin C. Uh, I mean, they re they reduce with age normally, correct? I mean, is stress, <clears throat> aging, uh, contaminants in the environment, all of these things are reducing our glutathione levels all the time. Uh, so, here again, uh, I guess uh, your opinion is that supplementation is uh, key and difficult to achieve. Uh, yes. Uh, you. What, what happens is the real ways to normalize glutathione inside the cell is to take the toxic load off of it. And this brings us back around full circle to something that I always talk about, which is dental toxicity of the root canal treated tooth. I yeah, mean, and I wanted to get there. Yeah. I can't Good. tell you how potent a toxin produced for the root canal treated tooth is. I can tell you that over 5,000 out of over 5,000 teeth extracted that had root canals, 100% of them had highly potent toxins and pathogens. So you don't have a non-toxic root canal tooth. And I will tell you, I see we're limited on time. So I will make my statements and you can, and it's now becoming very well documented in the literature, but I've stated for some time now that because of this continual release of toxins into the lymphatics and blood supply of the jaw, the root canal treated tooth is the number one cause of head, neck, and chest or breast cancer. Wow. It's also the number one cause of heart attack because the arterial system that first reaches it, uh, that is first reached by, is the coronary arteries. And in fact, in 2009, in the dental literature of all places, they finally, I will say admitted, but they finally published the fact that if you have one or more root canal treated, treated teeth, you have an increased chance of heart attack. That was an overwhelming admission, but it just shows that the problem's been there all along, and it's not getting any better because we're still putting in 20 million root canals a year. And this seems like uh, this is not on anybody's radar. I mean, you never hear anything about this in any kind of media that I've seen. What, what's going it's, on with that? Why is that? 
Well, now, now here's where I'm going to say, you know, you start getting this plausible deniability. And I mean, over 50 percent of dentists now no longer put in mercury. But the other less than 50 percent will till, still tell you the mercury is safe. I mean, exactly. What is that? What does that say about the mindset of of so many dentists? Right. Uh, endodontists. Their entire life's work is root canals. Are they seriously going to try to find a way to have the procedure that gives them their house, their child's education, food on their table, their vacations? Are they going to uh, give a look at literature that would say what they're doing is killing people? I don't think so. Now, how well their mind can shield them from guilt and make them think that they're really doing something that's good and that they couldn't really be hurting people. That's going to, that's going to vary on an individual basis. I'm sure some of them sleep perfectly well at night and a small percentage of them say, Hmm, uh, I, I wonder, I wonder if, if I am doing the right thing, but uh, all I can tell you now is, and we're coming out, uh, me and Dr. Kulas and I are with a, a new edition of our, Roots of Disease book because the literature that's come through again in the last three or four years is mind mind numbingly point on. You just make it now a complete no brainer to show the enormous reliable toxicity of root canal treated teeth. So the bottom line, if you've had a root canal tooth, you should get it out of your head. Is that your advice? Absolutely. Only it's got to be taken out correctly and the ligament has to clean out and all the infection needs to be clean out. Regular dentists, they just yank the tooth out and consider the job done. But it's more involved than that. It's not complex, but it's more involved than that and it's not routinely done that way. But yes, they have to come out. I'll say this. Uh, it, it might make a little sobering uh, final point maybe for my, my thoughts here. Is Now, this is strictly a theoretical point I want to make. But in my humble opinion, if all root canals were properly removed today and no root canals were ever done again and the entire population started taking 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day and nothing else changed, you'd probably increase life expectancy by 10 years. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's a... Yeah, I, I I happen to agree with you, but I, I also think if everyone got off the couch for thirty minutes a day and drank enough water and you know and ate, well, there's a lot there's a lot of things that you could do that would be really good for you. But yeah. matter of fact, that this sort of fits with what I just said is a lot of mainstream docs like to harp on how lifespan has gone up over the last few decades. Well, guess what else has gone up over the last few decades? Food preservation with vitamin C. Hmm. Okay, so when you're looking at the entire population, going from an average of 150 milligrams of vitamin C a day up to 300 milligrams of vitamin C, for example, is going to make a huge difference in mortality. Hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Wow. Hey, Dr. Levy, just a fine point on the news on the root canal. Can that extend to crowns and other dental procedures where posts and various things are being uh, put into the jaw? Well, now, the post, you're talking about an implant or a root canal? I mean, there, you, you never uh, want to put an implant, a post an, an inside the native tooth. Or a crown tooth. or you okay, know, that, various other things. That's just, just talking about that's just another, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. Are we just talking about root canals or also implants, crowns, and various other uh, restorative, quote-unquote, dentistry? <clears throat> implants can be great, but when they're done correctly, and most of the time they're not done correctly. How to do them correctly is very simple. You extract the root canal or whatever other tooth gets extracted, clean out the periodontal ligament and have a completely cleaned out area so that healthy bone can grow in. And don't begin the implant procedure for four to six months. Let healthy bone grow in. Hmm. What most dentists do in implantologists is they immediately start putting an implant inside an evolving infected cavitation. Wow. Well, I wish we could go for about another three hours because there's so many interesting things that uh, that you have information on, Dr. Levy. Um, I do want to just get, uh, because all Pittsburghers are inherently, uh, we lack a little bit of self-confidence about our city. So we love when people who come to visit Pittsburgh talk 
talk good things about Pittsburgh. So tell us about your your most recent visit and some of the people you met here. Ah, Pittsburgh's been a delightful place to visit. I I had no preconceived notion of what it was going to be like, but I can tell you without going into specifics on other places, <laughs> everywhere in the United States uh, is not as friendly, is not as open-minded, and is not as intrinsically intelligent intrinsically tele- intelligent as the people that I've encountered in Pittsburgh. So um, whatever has caused that to evolve, be glad of it because you have a uh, good concentration of, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, sound, uh, good people. Well, thank you very much for saying that. And uh, I want to thank Terry Taylor for being one of those people, too. She's sound. Uh, Probably not our Probably not our heavy metal levels, but uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe our DNA is Uber Alice. Who yeah. knows? Dr. Levy, thank you very much for your time. Thank My pleasure. You. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Thank you, Terry. I really appreciate both of you being with us today. Uh, next, we're going to move on to a little uh, video segment here. When your doctor says, eat more brownies, you might be wondering what that doctor is thinking. But if your doctor is Dr. Uma Puragala, and the recipe is for raw vegan brownies packed full of antioxidant goodness. Well, you just might say yum. So here's Dr. Uma with a video recipe. Not too long ago, I remember hearing on the radio all the benefits of cho- chocolate on news segments, and I thought, oh no, you know, maybe people are going to get the wrong idea and start eating tons of chocolate. But I think that the news segments were based on um, a paper that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it was an interesting uh, paper. They talked about polyphenols that are naturally in dark chocolate and how polyphenols reduce the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. Um, chocolate is, dark chocolate is also associated with um, reduced platelet aggregation. So platelets are those uh, broken up clotting cells. Chocolate is associated with reduced uh, blood pressure. And this was based on like half an ounce of dark chocolate a day. Uh, I started reading further and uh, unbeknownst to me, chocolate is full of really interesting drugs. Phenylethylamine, uh, mood elevators like anandamide and ananda in Sanskrit means bliss, uh, cool. Uh, serotonin, chocolate seems to raise blood serotonin levels. Um, but, there's always a but. Um, chocolate is, as we know, uh, it associates with all the bad kids on the block. Uh, like uh, sugar and fat, too much fat, um, and uh, soy lecithin, and all the 16, 17 ingredients that are in those candy bars. So today, we're going to take advantage of the uh, dark chocolate. We're going to do unsweetened cocoa powder, and we're going to um, take advantage of all the health properties and enjoy the chocolate fudgy brownie nature of this snack, dessert, breakfast food. I took uh, unsalted almonds and I put it in my coffee grinder and um, ground it into a powder if you have a spice grinder or a coffee grinder. And I'm going to put it in the bowl. Um, I also took uh, some rolled oats and I put them in my coffee grinder and uh, now it's ground into a flour and we're going to put one cup of that into our bowl and mix them up. There's about 24 medjool dates in here. I had to soak them in some hot water so they soften up. Sometimes I get lucky and I can buy uh, really soft uh, medjool dates, but I'm um, helping them along the way. And then we're gonna pit these. So when I pitted them, I got a total of two cups of medjool dates that I'm gonna put into my blender. There we go. I'm going to add a banana, a ripe banana, to our uh, dates, our wet ingredients, into the blender. I'm going to add a pinch of salt, and I'm going to add about half a cup of water, or just enough water to make this a um, thick paste, and then we're going to blend. 
I also have three fourths cup of um, organic unsweetened cocoa powder into the dry ingredients. And I'm going to stir around the dry ingredients. And we'll add our wet ingredients. So we're going to mix this up really well. And it's, it's uh, you know, you'll stir it around and it'll become a very thick, like a brownie batter. It smells very much like it. Um, and if you're really hungry, you could, you know, wet your palms of your hands and roll these up into little truffles and eat them. But um, I'm going to make them more like brownies. I'm going to spread the batter into a 12 by 12 glass um, tray and I'm going to put it in the fridge for about an hour. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I wet a spoon and I'm just going to um, even it out a little bit. And now we're going to just put it in the fridge. The spoon tastes very good. So that video and many more like it are up on our website, the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, and on our YouTube page. You can find us on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, probably some other places. We're, we have a Facebook page, too. Uh, make sure you like us on Facebook, and you'll keep track of a lot of interesting articles and what's going on around the western Pennsylvania area. Also, we have a meetup group, the uh, Integrative Medicine Professionals, for anybody who is a doctor, nurse, any other kind of wellness practitioner who is interested in these kinds of topics. If you believe the food is medicine and you understand there is a mind-body connection, you're probably one of us. So come join us at Integrated Medicine Professionals, and that's on the meetup.com. So that's it for today. Join us every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm Sven Hosford, and uh, Yuns, be careful out there.